The fourth choice for an entrepreneurial strategy, or the choices that matter, is the choice of competition. This is something that actually we're going to spend much of the rest of this section of the course on, because as you'll see, the choice of competition helps us classify and proceed to develop constellations of strategies involving the other choices. But for the moment, we'll just focus on that choice itself and what does it actually mean to choose your competition? There are two aspects to this. The first is choosing when to compete. Do you choose to focus your competitive energies now in the hope of taking a future prize? Or do you compete uh, in certain ways now expecting to be having to compete and compete intensively into the future? Which one do you choose? Second, who do you compete with? In many respects, you often think, oh, for an idea or a product, it's, you know, they have natural competitors. But in fact, there is a big choice element, especially for entrepreneurial firms and how they develop their products and whether they end up competing head to head with established firms or in fact choose to cooperate with them. So it's in that sense we talk about who you compete with. To illustrate all of this, let's watch a movie now uh, illustrating a new product. Well, it's a product from a, about five years ago, actually, uh, so that we can think about the competitive choices that a particular startup firm faces. This is the Copenhagen Wheel. It turns your ordinary bicycle into a smart electric hybrid by simply replacing your back wheel. Connect it to your smartphone, download the app, and you're ready to go. Bicycles are a great way to move around, yet sometimes distances are too long, hills can get in the way, and hard journeys to work may leave you covered in sweat. The Copenhagen Wheel is here to change all of that. The technology was developed over several years at MIT together with the city of Copenhagen, one of the world's most innovative places for cycling. Its original inventors licensed the technology and founded Super Pedestrian, the startup where we are now working around the clock to bring the wheel to you. Like the best riding companion, the Copenhagen Wheel learns how you pedal and integrates seamlessly with your motion. It captures your energy when you break or go downhill and gives you a push when you need it with three to 10 times your regular foot power. It's easy, ride it just like a normal bike. As you pedal, the motor automatically kicks in with no additional throttles or buttons. All technology for the Copenhagen wheel is contained within the red casing, including motor, removable batteries, wireless connectivity, smart locking, multiple sensors, and an embedded control system. Use your smartphone to customize your ride, monitor your physical activity, gather information from your environment to share with your friends and fellow cyclists. And if you're a software developer, you can even create your own biking apps. So whether you carry yourself, your kids, or your gear, hills seem flat, distances shrink, and you can cycle just about anywhere. So transform your bike and transform the city. The Copenhagen Wheel. So the Copenhagen Wheel is the sort of product that somebody comes up with, grounded in an idea, how can we use electronics and electrical motors and smart devices to make something like riding a bicycle easier to do. And obviously there's all sorts of great reasons one might want to do that. But what's interesting about this case is it automatically uh, allows for a myriad of different ways in which super pedestrian here could think about commercializing the Copenhagen wheel. So this was an MIT based invention came from a scientist Asav Biderman who is the CEO of super pedestrian and as you can see it's got a lot of elements that basically make well, bicycles smarter, but may, more importantly, more effective. The key thing about it is that there are multiple commercialization paths. And why we 
choose this case to illustrate it is uh, these are a bit easier to understand uh, why the same idea can go in different directions. For instance, you could take this essentially augmented bicycle wheel and you could license that technology to bicycle manufacturers who would then take that technology and integrate it into their own products. So it would be a pure technology play. Now the advantage of that is that those firms can tailor it to their specific needs uh, and may be able to add some additional developments on it, etc. And those benefits would flow back to super pedestrian. The con is obviously the role for super pedestrian is confined to the pure technology play. It may or may not be a con, but that's that's what it's choosing to do in that case. You could also have a situation where you take the product and you use it to establish a broader platform. All of a sudden you have all this sensors and other devices and interconnectivity being put onto bikes. Well, there may be all manner of other things that might come from that in terms of building out a community, traffic control, exercise, etc. So you could use it as a platform to build a smart bike community. And that might be a, an entirely different play. At its core is the idea of having a smart bike, but how does it present value to consumers might be very different. You could, of course, forget supplying just the technology to bike companies, you could supply them with wheels. That would allow you to manufacture those wheels, and to the extent uh, that a Copenhagen wheel uh, was a couple of thousand dollars, uh, that allows bike companies to mix and match whether they put it into their products, promote them, and etc. Or alternatively, I guess this would also allow you to supply wheels directly to consumers who already have a bike that they love. And that way they can have the Copenhagen wheel, but on their favorite bike. And one imagines there are all reasons why this might be the case. And then finally, you could say, oh, well, this is our opportunity to rethink what the bicycle is altogether. And so they might build out their own new bike. They might have a crowdfunding campaign and other things. And so they might say, forget all these other bikes. We are going to be the bike and we will take the wheel and we will build on a bike and we'll think of different ways that bike might be configured now that we have a wheel that means that consumers can uh, more efficiently use a bike. And so that's another way one could conceivably go. All these represent different commercialization paths, but you can see in each of them, they represent different people, different entities that super pedestrian would be competing with. In licensing to wheel manufacturers, they're cooperating with all of them. In supplying the wheels to the bike companies, they're cooperating with bike companies. Whereas if they choose to have a, a crowdfunding campaign to rethink the bicycle, uh, they're going to be competing with all of them. And if they choose to build a smart bike community, well, they have to sort of cooperate and compete with them at the same time because these bike companies may want to do that as well. And so there's different modes of competition that could be arising from all of this. So how can you choose among different alternative commercialization strategies? Well, that's basically what our broader question is all about. But in the context of competition, it arises in a situation where there's a, a strong force. The force is that of creative destruction. Most significant innovations have the quality that they create something but they also displace, cannibalize, or destroy what went before them. What that means is there's always a sense in which a new technology is competing with an old technology. And so that means that whomever is benefiting from that old technology, it may or may not have an alignment with the newcomers. It's the choices that the newcomers make that determine the degree of that alignment. And it's not obvious which way you want to go. I mean, in one sense, sure, less competition is better for all parties. In another sense, however, that may be inconsistent with ways that you could achieve the most value creation. No one said that monopoly was great for growth and innovation and things like that necessarily. 
even if it could be good for those who are party to the monopolistic deal. So this is one of the tensions that is arising through this entire choice. But on the other flip side, what this means is that entrepreneurial strategy does not always depend on disruptive competition with established players. There is a tendency in uh, much of the uh, entrepreneurship literature to assume that the scale of creative destruction is inevitable, the clash between the old and the new. But that's not necessarily the case. Startup firms may choose not to exercise that option and may do so fruitfully. They could do things that are cooperative. They can enter into production and marketing alliances. They could become a licensor or they can be acquired. Now, we generally think of acquisition as an exit strategy, but we should also recognize that in certain circumstances, how you're acquired, uh, how you exit is part and parcel of whether you are cooperating or choosing to cooperate in the past. The point about all this is the end profits and the end goal from innovation is achieved through contracting with more established product market competitors in this form. So you can choose to compete, in which case you don't have to deal with any of these people except in the marketplace, or alternatively, you can choose to contract with them, in which case you deal with them up front, but then you don't have to deal with them later on. You've got your interests aligned. And many firms have faced this. Dropbox, relatively early in its uh, uh, history, uh, got a uh, call from Steve Jobs, and they were interested in acquiring, acquiring them for a couple of hundred million dollars. Dropbox passed on that acquisition deal uh, and Steve Jobs admonished them and says, well, what you have here is not a company, it's just a product. It's, it's, it's at best maybe even a feature. And so of course you should deal with Apple, who could have used Dropbox at that time. But Dropbox chose to stay independent and is now worth, uh, at least as part of its uh, uh, market capitalization more than what it would have received from Apple those many years ago. Uh, so that's a, you know, a choice that uh, people made. Is Dropbox truly right that they've got more than just a product feature? Uh, I, I think at the moment time says that they've got more of a business than just that, and it turned out they could do a little bit more. Uh, but exactly, you know, at the time it was far from obvious. In biotechnology, acquisition or collaboration is the norm. In biotechnology, many of the startups in biotech firms uh, develop things, and their chief mode by which they take that to market is to come up with an intellectual property licensing deal with big pharmaceutical companies. And they do that because Big Pharma, not because they're necessarily thinking about competition, but Big Pharma have all of these important marketing, distribution, regulatory assets that would be just too costly for a biotech firm to replicate. So by doing a deal with them, they're, they're accessing that. And from the point of view of Big Pharma, that's obviously a, a great uh, situation to be in because they're uh, less likely to be disrupted or uh, get hit by the gale of creative destruction uh, because, you know, basically, yeah, they have to compete for the best biotech firms, but they don't have to fear them displacing them. So in this choice of competing with established firms versus competing to partner with established firms, which is the best one to do, is really going to depend on circumstances, capabilities, and other things. But it's a choice. That's what we emphasize here. When you're thinking about other choices, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's when. And that's a choice between what we'll call control versus execution. What's control? This is control. That little dude down there has a great apple tree producing unique apples. Why is he fenced it in? <laughs> He's fenced it in because he wants to prevent anyone from stealing his seeds for that tree and being able to duplicate the apple or apple hybrids or whatever it is he had developed. And so he stands there uh, with a cage and a shotgun defending it. Now, we have other means by which firms can choose to protect their innovations from uh, appropriation by others. 
But the point of view in all of them, you have to actually exercise a choice to engage in them. And sometimes firms make very different choices. This is Alexander Graham Bell and Elijah Wood, two of the sort of inventors almost around the same time of the telephone. Bell filed his patent a few hours before Wood, and so his patent was secure. But what was interesting is that uh, Elijah Wood ended up doing, uh, pursuing a different path to commercialize the telephone, working closely with Western Union. And in fact, Western Union offered Alexander Graham Bell uh, in the late 1800s a laughable amount of $100,000 uh, for the uh, te telephony patent. And everybody said, oh, well, why did they, uh, obviously Bell refused, why did they offer them such a low amount? Uh, must they have not seen the potential for the telephone? Well, it's not entirely clear. I think they maybe saw that the telephone patent might have low value because Elisha Wood basically said, well, I th we think we can build this out and uh, it's, it's going to build out around this patent and we're going to have our own telephone system. Now, as it turns out, that was wrong. Uh, in the end, uh, Western Union and had to give uh, Alexander Graham Bell a lot more to prevent uh, that infringement and to, to effectively forestall on any competition that they might have had between them. However, what it recognizes is that at the time, at least, it wasn't clear whether the intellectual property protection was the route to go uh, in sort of controlling the telephone system, as opposed to being able to produce a better telephone system right then, right now, and get it diffused quickly, which is what Elisha Wood and Western Union were trying to do. So it was a choice between control, that was the Bell strategy, versus execution, which is the Wood strategy. And it's interesting that we should talk about these things. Um, they are distinct strategies, but there's a bit of a puzzle behind them. I mean, in a sense, execution and control are two sides of a, uh, a path you can take to ensure that you can appropriate more in the future. Under execution, what you're doing is you're basically saying, I'm going to invest now in capabilities rather than uh, what's termed a moat um, and expect to be able to face competition in the future. And where I'll earn my money is by being of higher quality or lower cost than those future competitors. Now that sounds fairly exhausting. You have to continually innovate. You have to continually keep these capabilities up. But it does allow some advantages, which we'll see in a second. Control, on the other hand, is sort of more straightforward proposition. And, and to tell you frankly, many business school professors, myself included, had a bias towards these sorts of strategies when dealing with entrepreneurship. The idea was that, oh, where is your moat? Where are you going to build your moat? Well, it, it's nice. I mean, if you can take an innovation and you can build a wall around it and you can control everything, that would be good. But it's not free. Building a moat costs money, it costs time. Getting intellectual property protection and then defending it uh, also costs t uh, money and time as well. Uh, that can slow down your time to market and could actually end up being the wrong way to go. Um, so it's not very appealing to many entrepreneurs who just want to get on with it. Now, there are different trade-offs between these things. But the point here is both are legitimate paths. And for many inventions, you could do both. When you choose between investing in control versus execution, control is all about long-term appropriability, being able to make money in the future, like being able to invest now and have an annuity. It's part of the founder's vision to sort of take an entire market like that. And the, uh, you have to spend a lot of time concentrating on how you're going to get value capture with key partners. Execution is all about time to market, getting to market quickly. Why do you want to get to market quickly? We already talked about this. You want feedback and experimentation and you need that sort of um, signals to allow you to improve and get better product market fit. And it's often a lower cost, or at least a lower cost initially. And so that, for a resource-poor startup, may well be very attractive indeed. And so these things have different things. C control is all about, you know, things like being a, trying to get a patent or trying to be able to build a moat by being a first mover. Execution is about having a superior product, lower costs, and investing in capabilities. 
The time per market for control is slow, the execution is fast. And the future returns for control, they're going to come because you have some unique assets that you can put into the market and no one else can control, that's hence its name, versus the future returns to execution come from capabilities that the firm invests and reinvests in that are somewhat unique and scarce in the future. There's a bias against that sort of straightforward attempt. This is Marco Arment. He was one of the initial uh, employees of uh, Tumblr. And he went on uh, in the early days of the iPhone to invent an app called Instapaper. Very simple idea. You're reading something on the web and you want to read it later. Uh, you click on it, uh, click on an, uh, a web icon, and uh, it gets sent to the app and you can read it in a nice form. And this was a tremendously successful app. And here's what he said. You charge a small amount of money, and that's it. You're done. You don't need to go and seek venture capital money. You don't need to sell out your users' privacy. They're not even your users. They're your customers. For the first time in a decade, it's great. My goal has never been to dominate the market. My goal has always to be just making a living. Now, this is obviously what we call a lifestyle entrepreneur in some sense, but it's a choice as well. And a choice many companies might make is not to grow and to dominate a market, but to actually make a nice living and, and not have to deal with stuff. And it shows the scope of choices available. In the end, Instapaper was sold first to BetaWorks and I believe now to, to, uh, to, to others as well uh, as it gets passed around. But that's the, that is a philosophy that is certainly legitimate for an entrepreneur to have. So that's in terms of how do you compete, with whom to compete, as I said. You can collaborate or compete with established firms. And in history, we've seen people make different choices. Nita Rodak of The Body Shop chose to compete with existing cosmetic uh, retailers and, and manufacturers, for that matter. Microsoft initially and famously chose to cooperate. It was making software for and an operating system for IBM. It was not actually having its own brand name until later. And we saw this earlier. Sometimes with the same idea can have both of these things. Peapod collaborated, co cooperated. <laughs> Webvan uh, competed uh, in terms of bringing online groceries to markets. And there are different benefits for these things. The benefits of collaboration are you can enhance the value creation through partnership. You'll leverage the existing assets like the pharmaceutical companies already have it. And you can access existing companies without having to go out and grab them yourselves. And of course, you're going to mute competitive pressure. The benefits of competition is you create a whole new value chain, a different vision from existing people in the industry. That's what remaking an industry is all about. You create new capabilities and you serve different and new sets of customers than before, but you have to concentrate on establishing independent bargaining power because you're going to be in a competitive environment. So when do you compete? That's our choice between control and execution. Today for the market or tomorrow in the market. Today, patents, proprietary networks, own key resources. Tomorrow, don't worry about IP, you open platforms and you have develop uh, capabilities to compete that way. That's control, that's execution. Where, who do you compete with? Current incumbents or other entrants. Product market entry uh, is uh, when you enter, you're competing with everybody that's there. You have to use some tactics associated with that if you don't want them to, to crush you. And you have to develop assets yourself. If you're competing with other entrants, you can go for a licensing deal. It's very quick for you to scale and you have to emphasize partnerships. That's compete versus cooperate. Now, what's interesting is that entrepreneurial ideas are often anchored in the choice of customer, technology, or identity. So customers, Facebook were choosing its customers, users initially, Avatech was a company choosing its customers to uh, be able to measure uh, Lance, uh, snow avalanches. Uh, choosing your technology, Google, Lytra, we've seen previously, were all based on particular technology choices of how they did their products. And choosing your identity, Amazon said, we're going to deliver those goods at the lowest prices. Clover Food Labs, we saw before, was trying to think about how it was going to position itself in the fast food market, but not as a vegetarian option. An entrepreneurial strategy, though, is has these different choices that are uh, anchoring it, but we would organize it often around choosing your competition. And it should be no surprise, we gave you two dimensions, 
there's two dimensions to do so. This is the entrepreneurial strategy compass. One dimension is collaborating versus compete, the other is execution versus control. As we will see in a, a little bit, you can, we can use that to organize the literature on what sort of strategies entrepreneurs should pursue. And what we will emphasize is that none of these strategies are the way or the only way to go, as sometimes gets extolled by uh, their proponents. But instead, they represent choices themselves and a way of organizing the development of business plans in a useful way. So what if super pedestrian, the Copenhagen wheel, what happens to them? Interestingly enough, they are selling that product. They're selling it as their own standalone wheel. But now they've pivoted a bit to a new line for fleets, and they're using that to uh, enhance scooters for ride sharing for the same reason, trying to have electric scooters that are easy to use. We'll see what happens there.